Okie dokie, I am back again making tutorials, hopefully for a while, I hope, I hope for a while, because I do actually like making them. Thought I'd start with my most popular, most requested video, which is high quality rendering in Unreal 5. Alright, so not only, so we are going to be using this scene. Um, this is the LEGO U UCS Ultimate Collectors System. I don't know what it stands for. UCS uh, Star Destroyer. Uh, brick for brick. Even the insides. You can't, if I go into unlit mode. Um, here you go. All the <laughs> insides as well. This is the exact model. Uh, and each LEGO brick consists of even geometry on the Lego logo. That's that's not a map, normal map or anything, it's physical geometry. Uh, and there's a lot of Lego bricks, uh, and it's running in real time on my 3090, which is quite surprising. Uh, this isn't using Nanite because the individual bricks aren't actually that big. And it's running, it just looks good as well. If we have a look, we can see... Uh, there we go, Star Destroyer. There's all the parts. And that's running in, I assume, real time. Wait a minute. Yeah, there you go, 70, 80 FPS. How good is that? So, we're going to be using this as the test bed for our high quality rendering. And we're going to start doing high quality rendering by going to the project settings because there are a few things we can tweak in here to begin with. Alrighty, so uh, I'm going to go down, it's all in the rendering tab, and we're going to do a few things here. We're going to start by, well I guess let's start by how does un Lumen work? Um, so Lumen is a series of tricks, uh, it involves voxelization, screen space, global illumination, and software ray tracing. Now the software ray tracer relies on uh, a thing called distance field meshes. Uh, this is the w a way of storing a the geometry of a model in a 2D texture, and is a lot faster... Let me find... Distant mesh distance fields is a lot faster. So here's the distance field mesh of the Star Destroyer, uh, and because these are stored in 2D textures, it's a lot faster at uh, what do you call it processing it than if it was actual geometry. Uh, and then it also uses a lot of temporal sampling, so building up a history. Um, so that is how we end up with a real-time global illumination system. Now, one thing to keep in mind with the mesh distance fields is uh, they have a size limit. So, for example, trying to store this entire Star Destroyer in one mesh distance field is going to give you really horrendous results. Uh, I've got such a horrendous result here. It ends up looking like this, uh, which gives you funky results. Now, what you can do is you can up the resolution, but that will hammer performance. And better performance means higher quality render settings, so we don't want to do that. Instead, what we can do is simply split the mesh into lots of parts. That's why this entire uh, Star Destroyer is made up of individual LEGO bricks, because each LEGO brick has its own mesh distance field, which looks somewhat good. You don't, It doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one representation, because it's not used for shadows, it's just used for global illumination, so this is fine. You don't have to fret because like their Lego logo isn't showing up or anything like that. Uh, this works just fine as is. Now, if we want to increase the resolution, we can do that on a per object basis. If we go into the object, uh, say you do have something that can't be split up, uh, a good example is this park bench here. Um, it cannot be split up, so we have to manually increase the resolution of the distance field on this particular thing. Uh, simply do that by searching distance field, and we have a resolution scale. If we type 2 in there, it's going to be twice as large. 
you can also in your project settings go to lumens settings in rendering and we have down here distance field voxel density we can also increase this number or decrease this number I, be I believe it's decreasing makes it higher quality um, oh no it's bigger number okay uh, increasing that number will also just globally increase the size of them but I think this is actually this is a good resolution so we're getting quite a lot out of it already now the alternative you can do is if you have an RTX card which a lot of people probably do what you can do is simply go down uh, where are we rendering and enable support hardware ray tracing now you also need to set the RHI to DirectX 12 and enable just ray tracing in general, which is it's like three things down, I think, somewhere in here as well. Uh, and then we can go support hardware ray tracing. And then what will happen is instead of using your graph, like instead of using software ray tracing, it'll use hardware ray tracing and it'll trace it against the actual mesh because that is faster for ray tracing cards. So then you don't have to even worry about distant field meshes or how big they are or anything like that. Um, now that is going to get you the highest quality, so we are going to do that because I have a 3090, so might as well use it. Rendering. So uh, we are going to support hardware ray tracing, I'm also going to do ray tracing shadows, we need CPU skinning on, uh, I'm going to just search ray tracing, uh, use hardware ray tracing when available, that's the one I was thinking of, uh, so that's in rendering, I think it was up a little bit actually, there we go, uh, use hardware ray tracing when available, as you see there, it uh, does have some limitations, uh, more than 10,000 instances, so large forests and stuff doesn't work at the moment. Alright, we are also going to have to change the RHI to DirectX 12 to get... Oh, it already is DirectX 12. If not, search for RHI, find DirectX, and switch this to DirectX 12, so ray tracing works. Uh, we're going to change a few more settings in here while we're at it. Uh, we're going to leave the lumen settings as is, there's nothing really we can do in here. What we are going to do is we're going to turn off static lighting. So when you turn off static lighting, um, this means a few less shaders that need compiling, but it also means the uh, G buffer has extra room in it, so the ambient occlusion input on the material starts working again. So you can use ambient occlusion maps in your materials. So that's a little sneaky that was in the documentation. I don't think anyone, not many people saw it. We're also going to go down and we're going to enable defa uh, default luminance range, extended default luminance range. Uh, we're going to go down a bit more. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, oh, no, too far. Alright, so here we go, shader permutation. So we're going to untick uh, stationary skylight, untick light map, low quality light maps. Uh, we're also going to... oh, we're going to leave the others. So these two will also... they won't up the quality or down the quality, because they're, they're for stationary and baked lighting stuff, but they will reduce the number of shaders that need compiling as well. The last thing I can think of is the G buffer. So in the G buffer format here, what we can do is we can set this to high precision normals or 16 bits per channel. Now, one thing to note, because you may want like, oh, we'll just go the highest. The thing is, unless the textures you are exporting are 16 bits, um, setting this to 16 bit isn't actually going to do anything. Now, by usually, like Substance Painter and stuff, default to 16 bit normals, hence why you have an option to have only the normals in 16 bit. Uh, however, it's very rare for on the game side of things uh, for like other textures such as roughness and diffuse to be in 16 bits as well. Now if you intentionally put them in 16 bit then to get the most out of them you want 16 bits on all the channels. Uh, this project doesn't have actually any textures in it uh, so this isn't going to do anything for this project in particular but keep that in mind for other projects. So once we have set all that we do have to restart the editor. Alrighty, so uh, Unreal has finished opening, and I actually found in this particular case, um, Ray Trace Shadows actually looks worse. Um, so if I go and turn them back on, 
shoot engine what am I looking at rendering uh, so I'm using hardware ray tracing for lumen which is fine uh, if I turn on ray trace shadows it just I don't know it looks looks very meh <laughs> don't know how to say it. So turn it off. So I think Lumen Shadows looks a lot nicer in this scenario. So I'm going to stick with Lumen Shadows. Uh, less accurate, but uh, what looks better, in my opinion, is more important. So now that we've got that over and done with, we can go ahead and look at some render settings. So make sure the movie render queue is enabled. Uh, it is a plugin. Uh, uh, it is not enabled go ahead and enable it. Uh, we're also going to enable ProRes uh, like so, Apple ProRes, and I'll explain in a bit. Alright, it didn't take nearly as long to uh, load back up that time around, so we're going to go ahead and going to open my map. Or oh, Unreal's just going to straight up and stop working. There we go. Main map. Oh no, probably should have waited for it to be finished. Alright, so we're gonna wait for the Star Destroyer to build itself, which looks really funny in this sped up. <laughs> oh, I'll just dub over the Lego build sound. <laughs> Always find that funny watching that. Alrighty, uh, Lego speed build. Alrighty, so now we've got the Star Destroyer. We've got our uh, shot, my best attempt at recreating the opening of A New Hope, which you saw before. Uh, actually pr plays a bit smoother with ray tracing on. No, I take it back. It's about the same. Uh, looks really good. I'm happy with the lighting and everything like that. And our big Star Destroyer. I can't help but try and make the sound effects of it. Alrighty, so let us go ahead. Oh, okay. One thing to note: um, although the back here um, emiss has emissive meshes, and emissive meshes actually do emit light and light things up. However, that's really noisy, um, and it also didn't quite have the effect I wanted, so I added some point lights in here as well, just to give it a boost, as well as try and drown out some of that noise. So, even though emissive meshes light things, doesn't mean you should light things only with emissive meshes, because you're going to need a lot of samples to clean that up, and that a lot of samples means a lot of time. Alright, so, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Cinematics, Movie Render Queue, and I'm going to drag and drop in my shot here. Alrighty, so we're going to click unsaved config. So, a quick thing, uh, what we're going to have a look at is, uh, what I usually do is, I do ProRes 422LT as a preview for things. So I'll render, uh, and then I'll just whack on like a game overrides to get disabled texture streaming, uh, and, oh, camera, uh, frame close. Uh, and and that's about it. And basically, I just use this um, as my preview render. So I start editing things together, and then making changes to shots back and forth, back and forth. Um, so that's why I said enable ProRes if you want. Uh, and I think that's a really handy workflow to go back and forth. Uh, so now what we're going to do is, but this isn't a video called preview renders in Unreal, this is a video called high quality renders in Unreal. So we're going to start from the top and work our way down. So we're going to start with anti-aliasing. Now uh, what we're going to be doing is disabling some of the temporal effects in Lumen because they can cause artifacts between frames which means we're going to have to bump up, basically we're going to account for that. So we need to up our spatial sample count. Uh, I'm going to start with probably eight uh, Oh yeah, over, hit, just hit override anti-aliasing and hit none. So I'm going to start with eight and just to... I mean, you can... Actually, maybe four. This isn't that noisy. If you have especially a lot of emissive meshes, you may have to up this to a really high value just to clean up the noise. Uh, or if your reflections are coming in very noisy as well. Uh, under temporal sample count, this uh, attributes to motion blur. Um, so I'd rec I rec used to recommend this for... Uh, basically, leaving spatial count as is and using temporal spatial count, sample count, sorry, for 
Sam temporal sample count for uh, cleaning up ray tracing noise. We, however, we're not using ray tracing, so we can actually keep this rather low, um, and that'll just give us nice motion blur, but we don't need 64 samples or something like that for motion blur. Next, we're going to go to camera, and we're just going to have frame close. Basically, uh, this just means that motion blur trails an object rather than being in front of an object, because motion blur trails an object in real life. Uh, next, I'm going to go console I'm going to skip color output, but we'll come back to it. I'm going to go console variables. This is where the good stuff is. Alrighty, so, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, in the post-process volume, you want to scro scroll down and change the final gather and reflection quality to 4. Um, no one's recommending above 4, and I have I can't even tell the difference between 2 and 4 for this project. Um, like, put 100, I think that really hammers the frame, but frame rate, but you don't get anything. Like, I can't see any difference between any of them, but most people have been setting it to 4, so I'm going to be a sheep and just say set it to 4 as well. Um, I'd say, to look at it in your project and see if you actually have a difference, because I know that's probably going to increase render times, but if it doesn't actually do anything, then why bother, right? Um, now, as for console variables, a lot of these are from, minus the ray tracing ones, are from the Unreal 4 high quality rendering video. Uh, one thing to note is in Unreal 5 it's called Tone Mapper Sharpen, in Unreal 4 it's called Tone Mapping Sharpen. Don't know why they changed that console value. Uh, so Tone, I'll put these all in a comment uh, pinned in the video just down below, uh, pinned on the video I should say, uh, so you can just copy and paste these. But uh, we have our Tone Mapper Sharpen, this just adds a sharpening effect after the temporal, after the anti-aliasing, which sort of counteracts the anti-aliasing. You're welcome to do this um, in a, if you prefer to do it in a video editing software instead. Um, I've noticed this produces better results, I think, because of where it gets slotted in. Uh, this is a float value, so you can enter a decimal. Um, I'm just doing one and a half, I find easiest. One is its default value, which... Uh, now, our motion blur quality, this just increases the quality of motion blur, set that to five. Our motion blur separable, this just uh, keeps objects separate for the motion blurs, uh, which helps stop things mushing together. Uh, depth of field quality is for the depth of field on a cinematic camera. If you're using depth of field in a post-process volume, it doesn't do anything. So make sure you're using depth of field in the cinema camera. I assume most people are. Our bloom quality, which is the quality of bloom. Uh, now, uh, these I'm going to delete because I just used them to separate. Uh, our tone mapper quality. Now, uh, if we're rendering with ProRes, uh, we can use this. This will increase the quality of the tone mapper, which changes the lim linear image to Rec. 709. Uh, if you're using EXRs, uh, then just this won't do anything, so might as well get rid of it. Uh, more on that EXR versus ProRes in a second. Uh, now, I did go through a bunch of console commands. I, did, I just spent an entire night looking at all the different console commands in uh, Unreal five for Lumen, and I only found two of use. Um, a lot of them either crash the engine or make it look worse without, or don't do anything that I can tell. Uh, so <laughs> we have max rough Lumen, R Lumen reflections, max roughness to trace, mouthful that one. Uh, this basically says, so by default Lumen s doesn't do reflections for materials that are rougher than 0 0.4. This will just set that to 1, so it does reflections for everything, which I think looks nicer, because you get sort of much more accurate uh, specular highlights even on really diffuse surfaces. And our Lumen reflections temporal, we set that to 0, that stops it from sort of going, sort of building up the reflections over several frames. Uh, this is handy just uh, because you can have things lingering in reflections that no longer exist there, and so that'll get rid of temporal artifacts from that, hence why our spatial sample count is up. So 4x4 four four is 16? 8 is 16. Yes, 16. So we're taking 16 samples in total because it's 4 plus or oh, wait a minute, no, that's 
that's 4 to the power of 4, which would be 8... No, it is 16. Okay, what am I thinking? <laughs> yeah, so we're taking 16 samples in total there. Alrighty. So, they're the Lumen-specific ones. This one's if you're using ProRes. Uh, and these are the existing ones. And so we don't need to use any of the ray tracing ones because we're not doing ray tracing. Um, so, that is... I find that interesting. Uh, we're also going to go game overrides. This will we leave all these settings as is. This will disable LODs and disable texture streaming, which means the textures will all use their highest resolution and the uh, like. The models will all use their highest, their most detailed LOD. Uh, high resolution is if you're running ridiculously high resolution images, 12K, eight, probably 8K. No, oh, you could. 3090 would be capable of 8K. I don't know about pushing a lower graphics card. Uh, debug options, uh, that's new, I believe. That's just for debugging. Uh, Burn-in is just overlaying things over the top when it comes to your, uh, uh, like, frames, what frame you're on, what camera focus, all that sort of stuff. Uh, now our output. Here's the tricky one. Okay, so... I, l I recommend EXR, and that's a standard workflow, but a lot of people are tripped up by that for some reason. Um, either they don't understand uh, the concept of why you'd use an EXR, uh, which I'd hope to explain here, or alternatively, they uh, people were getting confused because it's like, we have a bunch of pictures, where's our movie? Um, so, if you want fast and dirty, fast turnaround, keep your color grade settings in Unreal, intact, uh, minimal post-working on it, choose Apple ProRes. This will give you a .mov file, handy dandy. Uh, in Rec. 709 color space, uh, keep your exposure settings. I'd recommend, uh, so 10, 422 is 10-bit and 444 is 12-bit. Uh, if you do not know what that means, do 422. Uh, just 422 or 422 HQ if you really want. Uh, they sort of up the bitrate. If you do know what that means, <laughs> the color means, okay, if you are going to push it really hard with the color grade, do 444. However, if you are going to push it really hard with color grade, just do EXRs. If you're rendering ProRes 4444, you might as well be rendering EXRs. So, uh, we can do like 422HQ, uh, in that case, that is everything we need to do. So then in the output, I think it's everything, did I? Oh, we also need deferred rendering. I don't know why I deleted that. That is simply the view we're seeing right now. So in output, we can choose our location. So I'm going to go, uh, a lot of people pointed out all my hard drives were full. They're I went through and emptied them all and filled up this 12 terabyte server in the process. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure that gives someone relief. Uh, next, what we are going to t I'm going to choose folder to render. So let's do render tests like so. I'm going to go call this one ProRes. Uh, select folder. Alrighty, uh, I'm going to do 4K, which is 3840 by 2160. Uh, because 4K is standard by now, uh, and everything else is a-okay. So what I'm going to do is save this as a preset, and I'm going to call this ProRes HQ Rendering. Save and accept. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to render it again, uh, except I'm going to do EXR. So to do EXR, what we're going to do is we're going to choose EXR sequence. Now this renders at 16-bit. Uh, now the idea of EXR is that it doesn't clip values. So there's no such thing as a blown-out highlight or an like non-existent under shadow, basically. There is detail no matter what the light range is, uh, which I will now explain now. Alrighty, so, uh, here I will be demonstrating the reason why you'd use an EXR versus a ProRes uh, in an extreme example. So, here we have, uh, let's turn it down even more, there we go. So here we have a uh, map ball, I don't, yeah, map preview ball, uh, with a texture on it with emission. 
right? Uh, and this camera is set to expose the sky. So now, if I set this emission to ridiculously high, um, what we end up with is uh, blown out. Uh, I don't even think it needs to be that high. If we try 10. Yep, blown out. So we've lost all the detail. Just to make sure, I'm going to go 15. So we've lost all of the detail in the texture now. It's just a white ball. Might as well not even have that texture there. So what we're going to do is then render this out, both in ProRes and EXR, and then we're going to have a look at it. Strange example, I know, but stick with me. Alright, so I have both of my renders inside Resolve, uh, and I'm in the color tab. As you can see, we've got ProRes 422HQ and EXR. Uh, EXR needs to have its color space set for linear. Alright, so now let's find, let's have a visual example of why we render in EXRs. I'm going to try and get back the texture detail. Um, so I'm going to use gain, so lift gamma gain offset, offset is everything at once, gain is highlights, gamma is midtones, lift is uh, shadows in a way. It's different to shadow midtone highlights. <laughs> uh, watch a video on that if you want to learn how to color grade in, on, in Resolve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the gain here and I'm going to turn it down and nothing. We can turn it all the way down to the image is black and we get nothing. The, that is because in the ProRes version, the highlights have been clipped. There's no data that exists there. We can make the high, the white darker, but we can't get it back any detail because there's no detail there in, to begin with. In the EXR version, however, the data for that is retained. So it looks blown out here, but as I start to pull the gain down, Oh, there it is. <laughs> I, I thought I'd screwed it up again. Uh, as we we have the texture detail there now. So that's 0 0.12. If I set this to 0 0.12, just to show I'm not lying, in all channels. Uh, let's reset that and just do it this way. 0 0.12. Alright, so this is what the ProRes looks like at that same... there. So in the EXR, EXR version, the data is still there, so you can push it infinitely in every direction and never have to worry about clipping. Because the data is kept regardless. ProRes, no. EXR, yes. So that is one of the many reasons why you would choose EXR over ProRes, especially for VFX and color and post heavy workflow. Now I understand most people are using Unreal probably to skip most of the post workflow, so uh, ProRes may be exactly what you need. But in the case that you need just that little bit more, uh, I would recommend EXR. All right. Uh, so hopefully that cleared things up. So we're going to choose EXR sequence. Uh, and now compression, we have PIS or ZIP. Uh, PIS is good for noisy images. ZIP is good for non-noisy images. Or we can go none. Uh, EXRs can get extremely large, so I recommend using a compression. I'm just going to leave it as PIS. Uh, or PIZ. I hope it's not PLZ. Um, and what we're also going to do is color output and under MISC we can disable tone curve. So what this does is disables most of the post processing uh, in our EXR. This will, I do believe this gets rid of uh, definitely everything in this film here and I think the color grading as well it also gets rid of. Uh, <laughs> but this means we get a true linear EXR. Uh, there is open color IO but I don't recommend using it because Unreal renders in linear. There's no point trying to change that into something else because you're not going to get any extra data from it. So I'm going to save this one and call this one EXR HQ render. All right, except now we have both our ProRes. Oh, I'm going to change the location of this as well to be um, ProRes EXR. Sec folder. Save EXR, yes, except save.
Alright, so now we have an option render local or render remote. Usually I'd say render remote because then you can close down Unreal which releases resources to the render, usually makes it a little quicker and less prone to crashes. However, there is a bug in Unreal 5, for some reason it does not respect uh, these settings changes. Uh, and to my knowledge, it still hasn't been fixed. So if I render it in ProRes HQ and go render remote, it'll render in ProRes HQ. Then when it comes to the second shot, it'll just use the settings from the original one, which is really, really annoying. Uh, I don't know why. Render local doesn't do it. So you just kind of have to put up with that until they update it, I guess. Uh, what I do recommend doing is changing this to unlit because that's just going to release some GPU resources. So we're not trying to render that and these. So go ahead and hit render local and wait. Alrighty, recording's done, so I'm going to hop over to DaVinci Resolve, which is what I recommend you use for um, more important, especially color-wise things. Uh, now this works in both the free version and the studio version, uh, so what we can do is we can locate our renders and we can just drag and drop them straight in. So if you use the media storage and go to the folder, then the EXR shows up as just a video file, not a bunch of images. So now, one thing you may notice is the EXR looks a bit funky. That's because we need what's called a color managed workflow, which you do not need for the ProRes. The ProRes looks fine. Uh, so to do that, we go to our settings in Resolve, uh, we go color management, and we can just switch it to, uh, I recommend Aces CCT in my last video, but since then DaVinci has released their own color managed workflow, and I recommend just using that because that's easiest. So we can select whether we want SDR or HDR, and what our output space is. So if we're doing like PQ for HDR, or SDR Rec 709, we're just doing Rec 709, uh, although both of these EXR and ProRes allow you to do HDR instead. So now that we have that, you may notice that even the ProRes one might change, I think, because of the default, but basically for the Co ProRes one, oh, there we go, it's picked it up out of the ProRes file, so Rec. 709 scene, that is fine like that. Uh, the, the EXR one though, it has not, so for input color space, all we have to do is select linear and that will pop it back into the correct thing. So you notice the colors don't quite pop as much in this one. That's basically because uh, it skipped most of Unreal's tone mapping. So it doesn't look as good at the back, out the box, but uh, it has a lot more room to be improved upon, unlike the ProRes one. Hence why I mean you know, we're looking at, for the EXR, we're looking at a lot of post workflow, with the ProRes we're not. Either way, we now have them in Unreal, uh, pfft, in uh, Resolve, so we can drag and drop them in and use them just like how we would normally. Easy peasy. Um, the other thing I wanted to see, uh, the this may be exaggerated by the recording, but there is slight banding in the bloom. It doesn't give a perfect gradient. Uh, and then that should not be the case. There we go, because the, the EXR is it's got banding regardless because of the uh, recording, but because uh, I'm recording in ProRes, so you're not going to see the benefits of EXR. However, in the EXR version, you've got a much smoother gradient in the Bloom, un unlike the ProRes version. Of course, then when you put it on a bit monitor, you get banding anyway. So, bum bum, awesome. Uh, Thank you for watching. I hope this helps someone at least. Um, uh, this project uh, will be available on my Patreon. So my Patreon's back up and running. Uh, not only does it have, will it have all these new project files, but it'll have all the old project files from my existing tutorial. So if you're looking for one of those, you can go and grab that instead. And I'm going to take a screenshot because I think that looks cool. Uh, there we go. Take a high resolution screenshot, please. Thank you. Yeah, so this project will be up there, so feel free to do whatever you want with a Lego Star Destroyer. I'm curious to see what people do with it. Otherwise, thank you for watching.